Hi, I'm Karen Sherry, the Curator of Museum Collections at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture. I'm delighted to welcome you to the latest installment of our Curators at Home program. This is one of the many ways in which the museum is continuing to engage with you and to share stories about Virginia's history with you while the museum is closed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. If you're interested in accessing more of these types of programs and other resources, please check out our website for a treasure trove of materials at virginiahistory.org slash at home. Now, uh, we couldn't do any of these programs without the help of our members. And I want to thank you all very much for your support. We're a private nonprofit museum. We don't get any operating funds from the state. So we very much rely on your support and, and thank you very much for that. Uh, now, before we get going, I want to encourage you, if you have any questions or comments during the talk, you can enter them in the comments section, and we'll be doing a Q&A session at the end of this presentation. So I look forward to um, addressing your comments then. Now, today's topic is Virginia stories from the Underground Railroad, and it's a topic that is about our nation's history with slavery. So it feels particularly resonant and relevant today as we're um, dealing with the recent protests and the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis. Um, and um, it's, it's a moment that prompts us all to, uh, I hope, to look to our history to understand the deep-seated and multifaceted racism that has marked America's history from its earliest days. And we're continuing to feel the legacy and the impact of centuries of racism and discrimination against people of color. I also hope that this history um, inspires us to be more thoughtful, reflective and to be inspired to make positive changes um, as, as we move forward as a community, as a nation and as a society. So I'm going to switch to my PowerPoint screen now and get going. So we are going to be talking about the Underground Railroad, which was a an informal system of local networks that worked to help fugitive slaves obtain their freedom. Now, uh, enslaved people had been running away since the earliest days of slavery in America from 1619 on. Enslaved Black people, um, uh, as evidenced by numerous runaway advertisements and reward posters that were published uh, throughout Virginia and the land. Enslaved people um, uh, had a universal desire for freedom and some of them attempted to gain that by running away, by trying to escape. It's really important to note, however, that being able to successfully run away was incredibly difficult to do. The vast majority of enslaved people who sought their freedom by running away did not succeed. So the stories of the Underground Railroad, uh, the success stories are, are really the rare exceptions and, and they are the people who managed to beat the odds, to beat an entire complex infrastructure and system that was stacked against them. Now, as I say, the Underground Railroad uh, was this informal network of people and places that provided assistance to fugitive slaves in their bid for freedom. And uh, it's really started to develop in the 1820s and beyond. And, and why? Why at that moment um, do we start to see the developments of these local networks. And there are a few reasons for that. Um, first is after the Revolutionary War, northern states gradually abolished slavery uh, in their states. So um, they created free territories. So enslaved people had a place to escape to. 
um, if they could manage to get to one of the northern states, they had the chance of living in freedom. Um, in the 1820s, we also see the rise of the abolition movement, which was made up of white and black activists who were opposed to slavery and the abolitionists, um, uh, many of whom got involved in, in helping fugitive slaves uh, obtain their freedom. Now, at this point, it's also important to note that it is very difficult to document the activities of the Underground ground Railroad. By its very nature, it had to be underground. It had to operate in secret because it was illegal to, if you were an enslaved person, to attempt to run away to seek your freedom. Uh, and if you assisted a fugitive slave, that was also illegal. Um, and so to elude the law and to elude punishment, the people who were involved in the Underground Railroad had to keep their activities secret. Today, we know some of the famous stories uh, and actors such as Harriet Tubman, but um, of the thousands of people who were involved in helping fugitive slaves escape, many of them, that are unknown to us historians. Um, and um, as I say, uh, it's difficult to, to document their activities. Now, today we're going to focus on Virginia's place in the Underground Railroad. And indeed, the Underground Railroad flourished in Virginia. And there are a few historical reasons for that. Um, first is geography. Virginia, which before the Civil War included West Virginia, um, Virginia was positioned right on the border between slave states in the South and free states in the North. So it was that proximity to free territory that made Virginia a place uh, where the Underground Railroad thrived. Another reason related to geography is Virginia's um, many, many waterways, its vast network of waterways, particularly in the Tidewater region in the eastern part of the state that linked Virginia to the Chesapeake Bay and beyond through its very active maritime industry. And this map shows not only many of those riv rivers feeding out into the Chesapeake Bay, this is a map that also shows the distribution of Virginia's enslaved population. Now, before the Civil War, Virginia always had the largest enslaved population of any American colony or state. And you can see from this map that that population was concentrated in the eastern part of the state um, near those rivers that fed out to the Chesapeake and beyond. So when historians talk about Virginia's Underground Railroad, they often refer to it as a maritime Underground Railroad because of the active shipping and mercantile industry in Virginia from its big ports like Norfolk and Portsmouth and uh, along its many rivers, the James, the Rappahannock and so forth. Um, in addition to these waterways providing transportation networks between Virginia and the, the rest of the country and the world, uh, these networks were also worked by a large number of, of black people, uh, free and enslaved, black men who worked in various maritime industries as dock workers, as ship stewards and so forth. And those uh, men often provided assistance to the fugitive slaves who were seeking to uh, escape from Virginia via the water. Unfortunately, many of their names are, are unknown. Again, as I mentioned, the activities of the Underground Railroad had to, had to remain secret had to be clandestine. Uh, so the names of many of these black mariners have been lost to historians. Um, and just to give you an example, one man who, uh, a black sailor who regularly helped fugitive slaves is only known to us by the nickname Ham and Eggs. Um, uh, many others who, uh, who assisted fugitive slaves, um, their names have been lost to history. Now, what we do know of the Underground Railroad um, 
is best documented by this man, William Still. He's quite an extraordinary figure who lived in Philadelphia and beginning in 1847, worked for the Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society. And from his offices in Philadelphia, William Still became a major conductor on the Underground Railroad. His office assisted many fugitive people if they made it to Philadelphia in his office. He could provide them with links to the Black community in Philadelphia. He could provide them clothing and food and so forth. He often also helped them um, find um, uh, passage elsewhere if they had to continue their trip farther north or, or to Canada. Um, now, what's so extraordinary, one of the many extraordinary things about William Still is that he kept records of the many individuals whom his office helped. From 1853 to 57, he kept a diary in which he recorded information about all the fugitive slaves who came to his office seeking his help. And then after the Civil War, he published these records in two different publications. So it's that um, those records that William Still kept give us some of the best documented stories from the Underground Railroad. And indeed, William Still's diary is full of references to Virginians, to enslaved Virginians who escaped, went to Philadelphia, and sought help from William Still and his office. And here's a typical entry from September 12th, 1853, in which William Still records that on this date, John Walker, who was 25 years old, he arrived from Clarksville, Virginia. Um, give some other information about Mr. Walker. And if you see the final line, he says that he arrived in a vessel from Richmond. Um, many of these enslaved people who arrived at William Still's office indeed came through Virginia's Maritime Underground Railroad. Here's another example of an entry from William Still's diary. This one dated August 27th, 1853 describing how Henry Foster arrived from Richmond. You'll also note the use of abbreviations. Those are abbreviations for William Still and his colleagues. Uh, he used abbreviations to protect their identities in case his records fell into the wrong hands. Um, William Still wanted to protect the identities of these people from the authorities, from being um, prosecuted for helping fugitive slaves. You'll also see in the last line of this record um, another abbreviation, a, a common abbreviation found in William Still's diary, how Henry Foster came per C of R. Now we know the C of R refers to the city of Richmond, which was a steamship that regularly plied Virginia's waters, transporting people and cargo between Virginia ports like Portsmouth and Norfolk and Richmond and others to ports in northern cities. And this vessel was captained by a man named Captain Fountain. Um, and we believe it was either Captain John Fountain or Abraham Fountain. There were two captains by that name active in the 1840s and 50s um, from Philadelphia. Captain Fountain and his crew regularly helped fugitive slaves and their bid for freedom. Uh, William Still referred to Fountain as one of the most daring and heroic captains ever connected with the Underground Railroad. And indeed, it's estimated that the city of Richmond um, was transporting uh, in its peak in the 50s, maybe about 60 people on average a month to freedom in the North. One of those fugitive slaves who escaped via the city of Richmond steamship was Clarissa Davis, who was a woman, uh, enslaved woman from Portsmouth, Virginia. Um, she decided to run away um, and um, she was seeking passage on board a ship, but it took her a little while to arrange that. So she ended up having to hide out in Portsmouth for two and a half months. And she, she hid out in a chicken coop um, as she was attempting to find passage. Uh, in May of 1854, she succeeded in doing so with the help of the steward of the city of Richmond, a free black man named William Bagnall. He helped her um, uh, gain passage um, 
uh, on a ship uh, on the ship that was leaving for Philadelphia. Um, he um, uh, Clarissa also, uh, in order to get on board the ship without being discovered by authorities, she disguised herself as a man. So she used that kind of very ingenious um, uh, technique of dressing in drag, if you will, to elude authorities and successfully get on board the ship. Yet she continued to have to hide out in secret during the voyage. And again, William Bagnell helped her by um, secreting her away behind the furnace. Um, and William still records Clarissa's account of her experience where she described how she went on the boat and was secreted in a small box near the furnace where it was very hot, where she suffered and thought she must die, wanted water very much, but was unable to get any. And that just gives you the sense of the, the physical hardships, the heat, the thirst, the, the physical discomfort that she had to endure. Nevertheless, I'm sure she thought it was worthwhile because ultimately she arrived safely in Philadelphia where she was reunited with some of her brothers and was able to live in freedom. Of course, the Virginia authorities were outraged by the activities of the enslaved people who uh, attempted to run away and those working in various underground railroad networks who assisted them. And uh, Virginia's governor, in, uh, Henry Wise, in 1859 said how he complained that our border states are so liberated by this exterior system by this still, silent, stealing system that they have no need to take up arms for liberation. Um, the pro-slavery Southern Argus newspaper, which was published in Norfolk, uh, issued an editorial on April 22nd, 1854, in which it estimated that slaveholders lost about $75,000 in property in one year. Um, and that's a kind of sad reminder of the fact that enslaved people were counted as property. They were legally considered property during the period of slavery. That means that they, um, uh, they were counted as assets as part of the slaveholders' wealth. So when they ran away, when they self-emancipated, they, um, they led to a loss in assets for their slaveholder. That angered Virginia authorities and the slaveholders immensely. Um, the same editorial in the Southern Argus also complained about the outrageous thefts and the secret agencies at work in our midst in reference to the activities of the Underground Railroad. Now, um, Virginia authorities responded to um, the phenomenon of enslaved people running away uh, by trying to pass laws. Um, the first law that appeared on Virginia books was during the early colonial period in 1639. Um, a law was passed prohibiting enslaved people from running away. Um, that law clearly didn't work because um, Virg Virginia's government continually passed laws um, about that um, uh, throughout the period of slavery. Also, um, as the um, uh, opposition to slavery, as the divide between pro-slavery and anti-slavery forces deepened in the decades leading up to the Civil War, Virginia's General Assembly passed a few laws trying to curtail the activities of abolitionists in the Underground Railroad. For instance, in 1836, the General Assembly passed a law that prohibited members of abolitionist societies from visiting Virginia because Virginia wanted to try to um, uh, block any, any influence they might have um, in propagating an abolitionist message. Also in 1856, the assembly passed a law which allowed for any ship leaving a Virginia port to be inspected by authorities. That was a law that was passed specifically in response to the many fugitive slaves who successfully escaped through Virginia's maritime networks of, of the many vessels that plied Virginia waters. Now, Captain Fountain, 
uh, ran into this law in um, November of 1856. Uh, authorities heard rumors that there were enslaved people, um, fugitives hidden on board his ship. So um, the mayor of Norfolk took um, some uh, uh, police officers, boarded the city of Richmond and started chopping up uh, parts of the ship looking to find secret compartments uh, in which enslaved people were hiding out. Um, fortunately, Captain Fountain was able to uh, assuage the authorities and um, left Norfolk with 21 fugitive people successfully hidden on board his ship. Now, um, Captain B is another conductor on the Underground Railroad who regularly appears in William Still's diary. Captain B um, is a nickname referring to William Bayless, who was a captain from Delaware who regularly traveled throughout Virginia's waterways, um, transporting people and cargoes from Virginia to northern ports. Um, now he, uh, even though he had, um, he was able to successfully transport dozens of fugitive slaves to freedom in the North, he did run into trouble um, in 1858. And this particular incident represents a, a kind of breakdown, if you will, on the Underground Railroad. Um, in um, late May of 1858, he was transporting five fugitive slaves hidden away on his vessel, which is called the Keziah. He was transporting them from Petersburg um, uh, to the north, and um, the authorities had gotten word that he was carrying some fugitive passengers. Um, and so to try to elude the authorities, Captain Bayless set sail really earlier than he should, ha should have. The tides weren't quite right for the trip, but he wanted to try to escape that inspection um, that Virginia authorities were legally authorized to make. Unfortunately, his ship ran aground and authorities were able to catch up with him and they found the five fugitive people who were hidden aboard his ship. Those uh, people were returned to their slaveholders, so they were returned to slavery. Captain Bayless was arrested, tried, and sentenced to 40 years in the Virginia State Penitentiary. That gives you a sense of, of the how harsh the punishments were for people who assisted enslaved people running away. Captain Bayless ultimately ended up serving only six years, but still, um, as I say, it gives you a sense of of how harshly Virginia cracked down against anyone who was um, fighting against the system of slavery. Now, perhaps Virginia's most famous and uh, most ingenious escape stories is that of Henry Brown, who came to be known as Henry Box Brown. Um, he was an enslaved man who was born in Louisa County, but he worked as a, um, a hired slave in the tobacco factories in Richmond. And that work allowed him to squirrel away a little bit of money, money which he saved up to uh, in order to purchase the freedom of his wife, Nancy, and their children. Unfortunately, Henry was dealing with an um, unscrupulous slaveholder who took his money but did not grant his family freedom. And um, that led Henry to uh, witness the horrific and tragic scene of watching his wife and children be auctioned off in one of Richmond slave markets um, uh, as part of the interstate or domestic slave trade. Um, and family separation was a regular uh, and tragic occurrence for slave families. It's estimated that one in three enslaved children were separated from their parents uh, because of the slave trade and one in five enslaved married couples were separated. And, and that is um, uh, one of the, the fates that Henry Brown had to experience. And in his narrative, he describes how after his wife was sold, he walked alongside her as she was being marched out of Richmond in a slave coffle. She was chained up 
with a line of enslaved people who were being sold down south, um, likely to work in the cotton fields. Um, Henry walked along his wife's side, holding her hands for two miles. And uh, in his autobiography, he describes how it was such a painful experience. He, he didn't even have words to describe it. It's really heartbreaking to imagine. Well, that was an event that prompted Henry Brown to decide that he was going to obtain his freedom no matter what. And he was going to, he was willing to risk his life in order to gain his freedom. Uh, so he came up with an ingenious idea of having himself shipped in a crate to free territory. So with the help of two of his colleagues, a, a white man and a free black man, um, uh, Henry secured a crate that measured three feet by two feet by about two and a half feet. Um, they packed him inside this crate. Uh, they drilled some holes in the side of the crate for air and Henry took along a bladder of water and a few few crackers. Um, and on May 29th, 1849, they shipped this crate to Philadelphia. Now the crate was addressed to the Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society in Philadelphia, which is the office where William still worked. Uh, but in order to get there, Henry first had to endure a 27 hour trip. Can you imagine 27 hours being cramped into that small crate? Uh, he, the crate was transported through several different modes, by ship, by wagon, by train. Um, and even though the crate was carefully marked this side up, the crate got turned over upside down at several points during the journey. At one point, um, so much pressure built up in Henry's head from being positioned upside down in the crate that he passed out. Um, when the crate arrived in Philadelphia at William Still's office, um, uh, William Still and his colleagues gathered around the crate. Uh, they, they knocked on the crate, very nervous about what they would find inside. They, they didn't know if this daring gambit by Henry Brown would be successful if he died en route. Um, they didn't hear anything initially, so they pried off the lid of the crate, and um, lo and behold, um, miraculously out popped Henry Brown. He first greeted the gentleman, and then he burst out in song. He started singing um, the Psalms uh, in, in um, gratitude for his safe delivery to Philadelphia. Um, really quite a remarkable story uh, to think of what he endured to get to free territory in Philadelphia. Now, um, Henry, uh, because of Henry's experience, he adopted the nickname of Brown. So he's known as Henry Box Brown to describe the nature by which he gained his freedom being closed up in a box. Um, he also published a narrative of his life and experience, and he became a bit of a celebrity in abolitionist circles. Henry traveled throughout the North, giving lectures to abolitionist societies and other anti-slavery supporters. He also traveled to England and Canada um, on the international abolitionist circuit. So he's someone who used his experience, which he very much described in religion terms as a kind of resurrection as he was successfully transported from slavery to freedom. He described that process as, uh, as a kind of religious resurrection. And just to give you one line from his narrative, he described how certainly the deliverance of Moses from destruction on the Nile was scarcely more marvelous than was the deliverance of Mr. Henry Box Brown from the horrors of slavery. Now, the um, activities of the Underground Railroad wound down uh, in the Civil War, um, the Civil War, which in 1865 brought an end to 246 years of slavery in the United States. Um, uh, the Civil War, when it broke out in, in 1861, it uh, brought many federal troops to Virginia. Virginia was one of the primary theaters of warfare and um, the presence of Union troops, of federal troops in Virginia led to a wave of um, 
enslaved people running away because enslaved people realized that if they could get across Union lines, they had a chance of, of gaining their freedom. So we see during the Civil War um, a, a lessening need for the networks of the Underground Railroad simply because of the sheer number of enslaved people who were running away from Virginia plantations to cross Union lines um, um, to gain their freedom. Um, so um, that kind of brings us to the end of the activities of the Underground Railroad. It's just a final note before we turn to our questions. Um, I think it's important to note that uh, in many ways, um, the story of the Underground Railroad, even though it's uh, certain parts of it are mythologized and, and many parts of it are difficult to accurately document, um, it is a story that highlights the universal desire for freedom among enslaved people. It underscores the often desperate measures they were willing to take, uh, the sacrifices they were willing to make in order to escape their bondage. It's also um, an example of uh, civil disobedience and the um, uh, cooperation of black and white people in fighting a system of slavery. It's a story that in many ways is a, um, is a celebratory story about the resistance to slavery that went on um, in uh, prior to the end of slavery. Uh, yet it, it's the exception rather than the norm. I think we have to recognize that the vast majority of enslaved people um, regardless of their experiences, um, uh, were, were stuck in that system. As I mentioned earlier in the talk, it was very, very difficult to run away. Really, the odds uh, were stacked against them. Um, so, so it's kind of important to, to remember that aspect, especially today, as I mentioned, when we are all thinking about our nation's long history of racism and discrimination um, uh, patterns that are rooted in, in our long history of slavery and segregation. So with that final comment, I would now like to open up the floor to your comments and questions. I, I look forward to addressing them and I'm going to um, turn, turn off the PowerPoint presentation so I can see your questions directly. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll read the question out. Um, we have a question from a visitor. Uh, instead of saying enslaved people were running away, shouldn't we say they were claiming their freedom? Running away inherently and subtly reinforces the notion that they were doing something wrong and that they were property. A pet runs away, not an adult human. Um, I, I think that's a great point, and it's a point that underscores um, the the sensitivity of, of of the sensitivity and the power of of language. Um, this is something that I, as a historian, um, have to uh, be um, very conscientious of. Um, and historians use various terms and words to describe um, the act of an enslaved person. Um, uh, escaping um, from their bondage, running away, self-emancipating, seeking freedom, and so forth. Um, so um, I thank you for, for that comment. It's an important reminder that we all need to think about the various connotations of the words that we use. Other questions? While we're waiting for more questions, oh wait, um, here we go. There's a question about uh, suggestions for books and other resources to learn more about these stories. Um, a, a great resource is William Still's records. He, he published two books um, about the, uh, the many, many people who, whom his office helped. Um, those books are 
uh, they are available in the um, Virginia Museum of History and Culture Library. Of course, we're closed at the moment. I'm not sure if there are digital versions of that book available online, um, but, but hopefully you can get your hands on that. Um, there is also um, a good book by um, Fergus um, Bogovich called Land of Canaan. And um, a, a second book, which is a great resource on the Underground Railroad is, um, oh shoot, the name is escaping me at the moment, but um, we do have the ability to add written comments to this. So I'll give, give those citations and the written comments. So please circle back. Um, another great resource is a resource that was compiled by Cassandra Newby Alexander, who's a specialist in African American history and is the Dean of Norfolk State University. And it's an online resource about Virginia's Underground Railroad. And um, if you um, just Google Virginia's Underground Railroad, um, you should hit upon this, this really great resource. So I encourage you to, to check out those resources for learning more information. Okay, let's see, here we go. Another question, how do you think learning about the railroad may have inspired protesters of today? Um, that's, that's a really great question. And I think that, um, you know, one thing that is inspiring about the Underground Railroad, about the activities of these, um, not only the great courage, um, and sacrifice made by the enslaved people who, who tried to um, escape, who sought their freedom uh, in that way, but also to the people who, at risk of their own life and safety, helped them out along the way. Um, I think what's inspiring is not only the courage of those people, but also the collaboration um, between enslaved and free people, between white and black people. And I think that's, um, that's an important model for us today. Uh, as I mentioned in my talk, if you weren't enslaved people, self-emancipating yourself was illegal. If you were a free person, helping an enslaved person was illegal. So the activities of the Underground Railroad represent an early form of civil disobedience against the practice of slavery. And while today's protests are taking different forms, they're, take, they're taking the forms of marches and petitions and so forth, um, I, I think the spirit of resistance to a, um, a system of inequality and of, of discrimination and dehumanization, um, those motivations are inspiring the protesters today. So thank you for that question. Any questions or comments? Um, one, uh, one thing I'll just note um, in thinking about the Underground Railroad as a form of resistance, as a form of civil disobedience, um, as I mentioned in my talk, it was very difficult to escape from slavery if you were an enslaved person. Um, and that and running away was perhaps the, the ultimate form of resistance, but there were many others and um, many enslaved people adopted perhaps less radical, if you will, forms of resistance. And, and among the, the forms of resistance included work slowdowns, breaking tools, pretending to be sick and so forth. So there were um, various ways in which enslaved people sought to resist the conditions of their bondage, um, uh, even though they were, um, uh, even though it was very difficult to do so. And, and any form of resistance could be met with extreme forms of punishment. All right. Well, uh, since there aren't any more questions coming in at the moment, I think I'll wrap this up um, with a final thank you for your continued support of the museum um, and encouragement to stay tuned by checking out our website to find other programs and activities and resources and uh, a final wish to everyone to um, stay well. But thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day.